Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Daphne Brown, you're back from the Arctic. What an adventure. What, you know, what are some of the overriding uh, powerful images that come back to you about having been up there that makes you say, oh my gosh, this is part of our world, but it's so different. Well, just about everything. <laughs> it's, um, we started in Greenland, um, uh -huh. which, which is quite different actually than the Canadian archipelago. Um, Greenland exists, it, it, it exhibits many of the qualities uh, of difference between us and Europe. The houses are pretty, they're painted bright colors, it's very neat and tidy, and they had ice. They had tons of ice when we were there. Beautiful icebergs, the world's largest ice fjord, that's, um, this glacier that's, that's calving and, and disappearing at, a, at an alarming rate. Um, it's got the ice cap. And so that was gorgeous. I mean, just gorgeous. You talk about it disappearing at an alarming rate. Yes. I was reading in your article that the amount of ice that has been lost over the last couple of decades is one thing, but what's happened in the last decade is even more uh, well, alarming. It, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. And I mean, the numbers, and you can, you can see it, there's a, NASA's got a, a little video um, where they show, they show the temperature warming in the, and, oh, since the 1800s. So we started in Greenland with some of the expectations that I had, which is we are going to see icebergs, we're going to see ice. We crossed Baffin Bay and barely saw an iceberg. Most years Baffin Bay has been clogged with ice. We went through the Southern Northwest Passage, the famous passage that Franklin couldn't get through, that hundreds of people died looking for Franklin, every year clogged up even 10 years ago clogged up, we never saw ice. Really? Like that was the most shocking thing for me, to never see ice. Okay, before we get too much into the details mm -hmm. of the trip, let's, let's talk about what was the purpose of your trip. Well, I went along um, on one of the expedition ships, uh, the, and it's a small ship. Um, there were scientists going along from the Vancouver Aquarium to look at, to do some experiments um, which have never been done before, which is to filter um, Arctic water to see if there are microfibers and microplastics in it. And there was another group from um, the Five Gyres Institute, and they were also uh, testing seawater to see if there were microplastics. They were testing for slightly larger microplastics, so they're very, two very complementary experiments that were going on almost every day. And um, I went along because uh, we at the Vancouver Sun decided that this was just a very interesting story and so um, I went to do a couple of those stories. I, the, the main stories that I thought I was going to write about were um, the Inuit people, microplastics, microfibers, sea change, sea ice depletion and, um, and of course I wanted to see polar bears. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's also a fascinating opportunity because so few of us actually get up there. I was looking at what the cost is to fly to Baffin Island. You, you could go uh, to Europe and have a two-week vacation for less than the, the cost of a trip to go to Baffin Island. It, and it's, you know, it is relatively inhospitable in the sense that you're not going to have any creature comforts. You are like in touch with uh, Mother Nature in, in a way that we don't experience here. But I think that, you know, if, if you think about um, the Canadian Arctic is so important to us. I mean, a greater part of our coast is actually in the Arctic than on either the Atlantic or the Pacific. We are an Arctic nation, even though there are only 33,000 people who live in Nunavut. But the only people who really go up there are people who the government pays mm -hmm. or people who oil companies pay or there are very few people who get to go or people like me who have their mm -hmm. company pay. Um, and, and so what has happened is that we don't really understand it. And the people who do go, um, the people who went on the expedition ship that I was on, they were paying anywhere from, I mean, the basic package is, is $10,000 for 12 days. And that doesn't, days. Include, that doesn't include the airfares. 
and you have to get there by charter. So it's not a choice of whether you pay for the airfare. It's not like you can find your own way because you can't drive there. No. There's only <laughs> one way in. <laughs> There's only one way in and sometimes only one way out. Is it magical? It's spectacular. It's spectacular. I, I did bring some photos along which, I, which um, we'll, we'll start to show. I grew up in Saskatchewan and so one of the things that, that, that was familiar to me was this massive sky. Mm -hmm. And because we're there in the summertime, it's a massive sky that never gets dark. Yeah. And so we were in Pond Inlet. Um, we didn't, for a variety of reasons, um, we didn't get into Pond Inlet. We didn't get to go ashore in Pond Inlet until 8.30 at night. And at 10 o'clock at night and 11 o'clock at night, there were kids playing basketball and there were kids playing baseball. And um, there was a, as we were leaving there, there was a guy butchering a seal at midnight. And it was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Vancouver. The furthest north I've been is uh, Yellowknife, mm -hmm. and I think we landed at about 10.30 at night, and I took a picture from the airport with the plane, and I could see the sun just along the horizon, but it n never went away, and then right. it started to come back up again. Yeah. Uh, and that was only there, which is considerably uh, south from where you were. It yeah. must have been like... Well, it's a bit disconcerting. Well, yeah. Um, um, but it's also quite enervating because you never, there's no cue for you to when, when to go to bed. Mm -hmm. right? um, and I spoke to a teacher in, in Cambridge Bay and she said, you know, one of the problems that they have in terms of educating children there is that they have started school already, but they don't know when to go to bed because it doesn't get dark. There's no street lights that come home and you need to be home mm -hmm. as when I was growing up. And then, of course, in the wintertime, it's constantly dark. And so yeah. for getting kids to school, there's no cue of when to get up. So it's constantly dark. Nobody feels like getting up. Whether it's 7.30 or 11.30 in the morning, it doesn't really matter because it all feels the same and looks the same. Or 11.30 at night. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So what's the feeling up there amongst people now that all of a sudden there seems to be a bit of tourism starting to leak in through people wanting to take the Northwest Passage? Based on your experience and, and the feedback that you've had, how are people responding to this? Well, I, I have to say that I was mostly on a ship. Um, yeah. I spoke to very few people um, in, the, in those communities. Um, you, very, you did go ashore in a couple. Though. I did go yeah. ashore in Pond Inlet in Cambridge Bay, but for, for a very short period of time. Um, in Pond Inlet, where I had more time to talk to people, there were mixed feelings. Um, there was the woman who organizes the cultural, uh, she's trying to lead a cultural renaissance. She's very, she's very excited. She's interested in, in, in using tourism as a way to promote um, further cultural re renewal. But another guy that I talked to who's a wildlife technician, he said, the last, he said, you know, a few years ago, some ships went through and they took everything out of our local grocery store. We didn't have any lettuce, we didn't have any fresh vegetables, we didn't have any milk for 10 days because they ran out of supplies on the ship and they just went through Bought the everything. store. Mm -hmm. And in Pond Inlet, what you have to understand about Pond Inlet is that they only get one re big resupply a year. So if you're living in Pond Inlet and the ship that they really wait for every year is the sea lift and that's when all your toilet paper comes in for the year. You have to order a year's worth of supplies in May and it arrives in August. And so it's a very different way of life. Mm -hmm. What they in some ways are more concerned about are the other ships that are going through. Um, in the summertime, they're getting supplies in. Uh, they are concerned about being swamped. I mean, on the, the Crystal Serenity, which is, is arriving there shortly, um, there are a thousand passengers. There are 1,300 people in Pond Inlet. And the thousand passengers on the Crystal Serenity, that's only about half the ship because that doesn't include all of the support. That doesn't include the marine crew. It doesn't include the people supporting them. I mean, that ship has almost double the number of people as in Pond Inlet. One but what, ship. But what yeah. they're concerned about more in Pond Inlet is there's a, a very large iron ore mine there, very rich ore body. 
and they have a proposal to run basically icebreaker ships through um, all winter long. And so what they'll be doing is cutting into the sea ice, which will cut off Pond Inlet from a nearby community, and they use the ice as a highway. So they mm -hmm. won't be able to visit their friends. They won't be able to visit family. They're worried about what it means for polar bears. What does it mean for seals? What does it mean for any of that stuff? What does it mean for going out and hunting? Because you don't know that the ship that, that's taking iron ore out, it may not take the same route that the one that went through last week did. And so you might have these tracks in the ice that, that the ice isn't, isn't frozen solved. They're more concerned about that right mm -hmm. now. Um, but there, that's a, theirs is a unique concern because that's one of the very, that's one of the few mines. In the, but I think when we talk about the changing Arctic, when you have depleting ice, it means that all of these resources become much more accessible. And if you start to do that kind of resource development, yes, it creates jobs. I mean, the guy who was concerned about, who was concerned about the, the ice being, he'd worked at the mine. He said, it's great. Like, lots of my friends work at the mine. They get well paid. And at Pond Inlet, getting a well paid job is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Because a package of craft dinner, how much do you think a package of craft dinner would cost there? 20 bucks? It's $5.95. Oh, okay. okay, you overextend it. <laughs> but, well, but even I'm so. I'm just starting to imagine what it takes to get it there. Yeah, and so $5.95 for, for a craft dinner. Well, and, I mean, and it, if you have to order it in May to get it in August right. and have a whole year's supply, as the retailer, you're laying out a lot of money to yeah. be able to carry that. I, I wonder yeah. how they make money at five ninety five for a, a box of KD. Well, <laughs> and, you know, things like a, 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 big, a big jar of peanut butter is like $12. Wow. Cheese Whiz is 10 bucks, And, I mean, we're not even talking about, frankly, good food. It's, mm -hmm. it's highly processed. And again, this is one of the problems for the Inuit, um, is that they've been living a traditional lifestyle with this, and increasingly they're getting these processed foods. As the sea ice recedes, as it gets harder to hunt, as all of these various marine mammals and fish and so on are having more trouble, so are the Inuit because that's what they rely on. If you can't have what they call country food, you've got to supplement it with something else. It's very expensive, very expensive, highly processed. So what you see up there is high rates of diabetes, really bad dental mm. health, um, and people are drinking pop like crazy, slushies. Oh, and I went to, in Pond Inlet, I did go to the northernmost Tim Hortons in the world. The northernmost Tim Hortons. So Only. they're donuts too. <laughs> well, how much is it for a coffee at the northernmost Tim Hortons? I was in the too world? late. I couldn't. I, it was closed. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the land where the sun doesn't set, Tim Hortons was closed. It was. Yes. <laughs> oh, my. It was ten thirty at night. But there is a candy uh, store that opens uh, in some guy's house. It's all boarded up, and and he sort of sells candy through the window after ten o'clock. I know it's creepy. You wouldn't have that down here, but up there it's perfectly normal because everybody knows it. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. It's clear to you from having been there that something's happening. The environment is changing. Or is it hard to tell because you're sort of in and out? <laughs> um, the environment is changing. Uh, certainly everyone I spoke to, uh, from the people who run the ships, who've been on these ships, um, John Nightingale, for example, for the president of the, the Vancouver Aquarium, he's been going up for years. He said he's never seen it like this. The expedition leader, Aaron Lawton, um, who's the operations manager for One Ocean Expeditions, never seen it like this. Um, the captain on the Russian ship that I was on has never seen it like this. The Inuit people have never seen it like this. And, and you can argue whether it's because of, of man-made climate change, but it doesn't matter. It's changing. It's changing. It's changing so fast. I mean, we've seen, um, we're seeing the ice cap in, in Greenland disappearing. This year's ice, I just looked it up this morning, 
NASA says that, or NASA's satellite imagery, it's not the worst year we've had, it's the third wor year, worst year we've had for sea ice melting. Hmm. There's a and, it's, and it's going further north. There's a fellow that I know that's been working on a, a project uh, up in the Northwest Territories and into Nunavut and, um, where they're doing work uh, laying down uh, cable in the permafrost. And he said year over year things are changing. And it confounds him because he was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I hear all this stuff about climate change and yes, it's having an effect. But there he is and he's saying, okay, the permafrost is is changing. Like it's it's actually changing. Yeah. And so that must be very disconcerting and it must have profound effects on a way of life for so many people. Well, the people who call the far north home. What does, what is happening is that the permafrost is melting at a much higher rate. So there are houses that are collapsing. There are roads that are caving in. There are um, it's just getting warmer. This mm -hmm. is the warmest summer ever in the Eastern Arctic. Um, as long as we've had records. There are people that say yes, but the Thule people, they were in the Arctic, you know, 1500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they had gardens. So there are arguments. The hardest thing for me to grasp is I have read all so much about the what's going on climate, global temperatures, that we're up about globally about 0.8 degrees. Like that, that's the increase since 1880. Um, and I think, okay, how can just slightly less than one degree Celsius make such a profound difference in the Arctic? Is something different happening there than it is? when you sort of, I guess, spread it out around the world. And I'm, I'm fascinated to, to know what it is, but to hear your firsthand experience about actually seeing that change right in front of your eyes. The University of Alberta is doing very good work tracking, tracking polar bears. And what they're finding with polar bears is they're having to swim further because there isn't ice that they can get on. So that means that, that they're not as healthy, so their population is they're not, they're not on the endangered list. They're at one of the species, they're, they're the level below that. But what they're finding is the female bears are having fewer cubs. They're finding that the average weight is lower. They're finding all of these things that are, are, are indicating that this is a species that's not doing very well. The caribou aren't doing as well. And what it, I mean, what, what it comes down to is that unlike Unlike in many other places, in terms of, of the food chain, um, everything in the Arctic depends on the ice. So under the ice, you get photoplanktons that are growing. And those photoplanktons feed the foundational species, which is mm -hmm. Arctic cod. Everybody eats, everybody eats Arctic cod. Anything bigger than zooplankton and, and photoplankton, cod is the, is the species. The cod are, are not going to do very well either if the because, because they, the cycle the, of life is being interrupted and yeah. so it goes all the way up the chain and down mm -hmm. the chain mm -hmm. and again like it, it seems to me that that it doesn't matter what's causing this change you can are like it's it, I'm they would I'm sure everyone would like to know when is it going to end what's it going to look like are are these some of these quite lovely beaches are we going to be putting up umbrellas and serving mai tais on them um, but but if fundamentally, it is changing, and there are species that are changing. They're finding species up there that never used to be up there. Mm -hmm. They're finding grizzly bears moving further. They've found this. They've found um, the grizzly. Well, grizzly bears and, and and polar bears actually come from the same source, so they actually can they actually can mate, and they have they have mm -hmm. a couple of examples. They found a couple of baby bears that are half and half, and those little baby bears are now able to reproduce like they they really so it may be that the polar bears and the grizzlies will adapt some way go back to something or other mm -hmm. so species will adapt but will they adapt fast enough and, and that's, and the, that's question. the thing isn't that it? is yeah. the real question yeah. if this is speeding up to the point and you know some of those graphs they go like this and then they go straight up yeah we may be in that straight up phase and if we are can we adapt that quickly? And certainly the question of can we adapt that quickly is one that the Inuit 
ask themselves. I mean, these are the most resilient people in the world. Like th they live in the harshest climate. They have survived for thousands of years. They can adapt, but can they adapt quickly enough too? It's so fascinating, but I gotta get you to hang on for one last break, one last commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. The research about plastics in the ocean, we're yeah. already starting to hear some of the results coming in. Right. It's not good. We need to change our perception of plastics in the ocean to smog because mm -hmm. it's not big chunks. There are these little chunks. There are tons and tons and tons of little tiny pieces and those are getting into the food system. And they're getting into uh, microorganisms and larger Absolutely. animals of, of all sorts, of and then they work sorts. their way into our food chain as well. Well, the shocking thing mm -hmm. he said to me is, <laughs> is mm -hmm. he said, if you eat oysters, he said, you're basically chowing down on your own fleece. You know that fleece jacket? We all wear fleece. We're in Vancouver, everybody's got right. fleece. You put it in the laundry, 2,000 fibers are likely to come off it every time you wash. That's going to go right through the domestic sewer system, right out into the ocean, eaten by phytoplankton, which is eaten by the next species. I mean, the, the work that's been done at the Vancouver Aquarium on microplastics and microfibers, off our coast, it's terrible. The, the, the yearlings, the, the little salmon babies, they're eating a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. And so are, the, so are the adults that are returning. And we're eating them. And the whales, those baleen whales, tons of the stuff they're filtering through. It's shocking. And so what do you wear? I mean, on the ship, I got to tell you, there were a lot of people wearing fleece on the ship. We started to feel badly about it. <laughs> I didn't take any. I have to tell you, I did <laughs> not take any. I did my research before, and I thought, I'm not showing up on the ship with fleece. Plastic bags, plastic, it all breaks down. This was quite an experience for you, wasn't it? It's extraordinary. It was just an extraordinary experience. It's changed you. Um, Maybe reinforced things that you might might have uh, uh, felt before, but I can see that it's affected you quite deeply. Oh, it has. Yeah. It yeah. has. I mean, it, it, the the entire experience of being there and spending time on a ship with experts and people who are so deeply engaged in thinking about what's happening to the world and and how do we make the world a better place? And can we make the world a better place? Which is not such a bad thing. It's not such a bad thing. Thank you for coming in and sharing My part pleasure. of your experience. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. People can see the rest of it in your articles that are all posted on the Vancouver Sun website. Thanks.